Tonight, stolen hopes. Pakistan's voters cry foul following a neck-and-neck -neck result on the presidential elections. What do these results mean for the future of Pakistan's politics? Find out tonight. Free at last. Qatar releases eight imprisoned Indians following months of back-and-forth espionage claims. With the future of the two nations' diplomatic ties finally seeing some sense of stability. Bittersweet return. Israel rescues hostages from Gaza. While some families breathe a sigh of relief, others scramble for cover from relentless missile fire in Rafah. And hopping hooligan. A kangaroo has an adventure of a lifetime, complete with a cinematic police chase. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Anuradhika World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. Welcome to World News tonight. Thanks very much for your time tonight. We have some updates for you from across the globe, some that developed over the weekend and some that are unraveling as we speak. But first we begin with what could be one of the final few chapters of the Pakistan elections. Supporters of Pakistan's jailed former Prime Minister Imran Khan protested amid uncertainty for the country's future as results of national elections were finally released, putting Khan backed independence in the lead but making rival Nawaz Sharif's party the biggest in parliament without a clear majority. The results of Pakistan's national election were finally released on Sunday, putting independence backed by jailed former Prime Minister Imran Khan in the lead, but with no clear majority. <laughs> Hundreds of Khan supporters protested in Karachi against the results, saying the election was stolen from his party, PTI. Their candidates were forced to run as independents by electoral officials. They won 93 seats out of 264, while their biggest rival, the party of another former Prime Minister, Nawaz Sharif, won 75. That means the largest single party in parliament is Sharif's. And the independents will lose out on reserved parliamentary seats that are given to the strongest parties. The PTI supporters also condemned the delay in publishing the final tally of votes. That took place more than 60 hours after voting ended. Pakistan's interim government said the voting count delay was caused by communications issues due to a mobile internet outage on election day. Authorities said the outage was for security reasons, but it's strong concern from human rights groups and foreign governments. Coalition talks are now full steam ahead. In the coming days, a prime ministerial candidate has to show a simple majority of 169 seats in the National Assembly when the House is called. Khan-backed candidates will have to try and join a smaller party in parliament, while Sharif's party said that he had met with representatives of the minority regional MQM party, who had agreed to, quote, in principle work jointly in the larger interest of the country. MQM supporters were celebrating in the early hours of Monday after winning seats in the election. An MQM leader confirmed the meeting, but said no formal coalition deal had been made. If no one is able to form a government, Pakistan's army, the most powerful and organized force in the country, could step in to restore order and take power, as it has done three times already in the country's 76-year history. India's foreign ministry said that Qatar has released eight Indian ex-naval officers after dropping their death sentences, crediting the Qatari emir for the decision more than 18 months after their arrest challenged diplomatic ties. The men were charged with spying for Israel, though India and Qatar did not confirm these charges. India said seven of these officers have returned back to the country and some of the men told media on arrival in New Delhi that it was Prime Minister Narendra Modi's personal intervention that helped free them. New Delhi engaged in talks for months with Qatar after the men were arrested in August 2022 and the case challenged ties with Doha, a crucial natural gas supplier to India, one of the world's top energy importers. A preliminary court sentenced them to death last year prompting India to express deep shock and file an appeal. The MIA confirmed in December that it had gained consular access to the prisoners. Later the same month, it said an appeals court had commuted their death sentence to varying prison terms. The eight were senior employees of Dahara Global Technologies and Consulting Services, a company advising on a Qatari program aimed at obtaining high-tech, Italian-made submarines that could evade radar detection. The private firm has since been shut down. 
Israel has rescued two hostages from southern Gaza as it launched a fresh round of airstrikes in the city of Rafah. Benjamin Netanyahu says there is room for more than a million people to evacuate, doubling down on plans for a ground invasion into the area. The death toll of Palestinians from Israeli attacks in the Gaza Strip has risen to over 28,000 and added that over 100 Palestinians were killed by Israeli attacks in the past 24 hours. Israel launched a special forces operation that freed two Israeli hostages in Rafah on Monday. The operation also included airstrikes, which local health officials said killed and wounded dozens in the southern Gaza city. The Israeli military identified the freed hostages as Fernando Simon Marmon and Louis Hare. The two men were kidnapped by Hamas on October 7th, along with 250 others, according to Israeli tallies. Israel has responded with a military assault on the Gaza Strip that has killed more than 28,000 Palestinians, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Residents of Rafah said Monday's attacks caused widespread panic. They added that planes, tanks and ships took part in the strikes and that two mosques and several houses were hit. Some feared a ground offensive into the city had begun. Alayla. The Israeli military said on Monday it had conducted a, quote, series of strikes on southern Gaza that had now, quote, concluded without providing further details. A military spokesman said Marmon and Hare were extracted from the second story of a building by Israeli forces under the cover of an airstrike. The military said they were in good condition and had been taken to a hospital near Tel Aviv. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said in an interview aired on Sunday that, quote, enough of the 132 remaining Israeli hostages held in Gaza were alive to justify Israel's war in the region. His office has said that it had ordered the military to develop a plan to evacuate Rafah and destroy four Hamas battalions it says are deployed there. Hamas-run television on Sunday quoted a senior Hamas leader as saying any ground offensive in Rafah would, quote, blow up the hostage exchange negotiations. The same day, Egypt warned of, quote, dire consequences of a potential military assault on Rafah, which lies near its border. Aid agencies say an assault on Rafah would be catastrophic, as it is the last relatively safe place in an enclave devastated by Israel's military offensive. the road to the White House now, top Western officials criticize former President Donald Trump after he suggested the U.S. might not protect NATO allies from a potential Russian invasion if those countries hadn't spent enough on defense. Trump's comments came during a weekend rally in South Carolina in which he appeared to recount a meeting with NATO leaders. Nikki Haley and Donald Trump ricocheted their arguments over their campaign trails as the South Carolina primaries loom. Former President Donald Trump under fire tonight after saying he would support Russia attacking U.S. allies that don't pay what he deems their fair share. I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. His comments threatening to upend the NATO alliance if he retakes the White House and sparking swift backlash from both sides of the aisle. The White House slamming the comments as appalling and unhinged. <laughs> And this reaction from Mr. Trump's sole GOP opponent, Nikki Haley, on the campaign trail today. Trump said the most irresponsible thing. You certainly don't want to give them the right to invade a friend. Haley also firing back at Trump for questioning why her husband, who's deployed overseas, is not by her side. What happened to her husband? Where is he? He's gone. Donald Trump clearly doesn't understand that in South Carolina, we love our military men and women. The former South Carolina governor betting big on the Republican primary in her home state, despite trailing her former boss there by double digits. Haley trying to capitalize on the age gap between her and the race's two front runners. Do we really want to have a country in disarray in a world on fire and have two 80 year olds as our candidates? The issue of age, a political vulnerability of President Biden's, taking on a new significance in the days after the special counsel's report on Mr. Biden's handling of classified documents revealed scathing allegations about his memory struggles, which the president denies.
death and destruction have marred Ukraine since Russia's full-scale invasion in February 2022. Ukrainians are facing the second anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion of their country. Civilian casualties are around 30,000 according to the UN, although the true figure is likely much higher. Meanwhile, the scale of deaths in the army is unknown and a tightly held secret which estimates ranging between 25 to 70,000. The Ukrainian army is widely respected for its early successes, driving Russia out of half the territory it took in the early days of the territorial conquest. But according to military experts, the war is now in a stalemate. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky sacked his top general at a crucial time. Soldiers are in serious need of ammunition and vital support from the United States is in question. The sheer ruthlessness of Russian forces was first known in places such as Bucha, Bordyanka, where civilians were murdered in cold blood in extrajudicial killings as part of the occupation's approach towards the capital, Kyiv. The EU is now supporting Ukraine in reconstruction. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with an update on King Charles's health condition. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Britain's King Charles attended church in his first public outing since announcing last week he had been diagnosed with cancer and would postpone some engagements to undergo treatment. The king, wearing a brown overcoat and carrying an umbrella, waved as he arrived with his wife Camilla at St. Mary Magdalene Church in Sandingham in eastern England. Charles, who is spending time at his rural Sandingham estate, issued a message expressing gratitude to well-wishers following his diagnosis. While undergoing treatment, Charles has postponed public engagements, but is planning to continue with much of his private work as monarch, including having his weekly audience with the Prime Minister and dealing with state papers. Residents of Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, said they were looking forward to presidential and legislative elections just two days before voters cast their ballots nationwide. The election, which takes place Wednesday, is a tight contest between retired general and third-time runner Prabowo Subianto, former Jakarta governor Anis Baswedan and central Java governor Ganjar Pranovo. Surveys have consistently shown Prabowo is the candidate to beat, with a lead that stretched to about 28 points in polls released late last week, which projected him a winning majority. Jakarta voters said that their voices are divided this time around. They swing their votes from one candidate to another, so it's more unpredictable. Researchers at the Center of Strategic and International Studies said that this year's election will be a test for Indonesian democracy, as outgoing President Joko Widodo is deeply involved in influencing emotions and attitudes of voters. Leading up to the election, the campaign scene has been fraught with drama. Widodo, better known as Jokowi, betrayed his own party, the Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle which had nominated Ganja and started tacitly campaigning for rival candidate and former military hardman Prabowo. In October, Prabowo controversially named Jokowi's son as his running mate, a move which saw Prabowo's popularity soar, which critics say are signs that Jokowi is building a political dynasty and eroding the country's hard-won democracy. Jokowi has brushed off the criticism, saying the choice of the leader should be left to the people. The death toll from a landslide that struck southern Philippines has risen to 55, with rescuers combing through the mud and rubble in search for missing people. The landslide hit the mountain town of Macho in Davao de Oro province, burying several homes, vehicles and dozens of people. A total of 32 people have been injured in the tragedy and provincial authorities are consolidating efforts to provide aid for those who have been displaced by the disaster. Meanwhile, cloudy skies and intermittent rains have made rescue operations arduous and the threat of another potential landslide is heightening. Rescue teams are continuing to dig in search of survivors but there have been no signs of life and more body bags are hauled. Heavy landslides also hit different parts of the province with thousands of residents evacuated to safety and staying in shelters. An update on the European farmers' protest now. Spanish police scuffled with a group of farmers and lorry drivers in Madrid as they tried to access a main road in a bid to block it. One of several protests sweeping the EU against the bloc's environmental rules and what workers see as excessive taxes and red tape. We have out there in a world news special correspondent Natasha Lowe in Verona, Italy with the latest. Natasha. Yes, I'm ready. A group representing drivers and a newly created farmers group 
decide to come together calling for a national strike to jointly demand action from Spanish and European leaders. They claim rules to protect the environment make them less competitive compared to other regions. Members of both groups waving Spanish flags and shouting Viva España gathered in, in a parking lot near Atlantic de Madrid Stadium and voted in favor of joining forces. They will protest together from now on. Spanish farmers have joined peers from Germany, France, Italy, Portugal and Belgium in daily protests that include blocking several highways and ports. Shortly after the vote, hundreds of protesters walked around the Madrid Stadium before trying to access the main street via a dirt road. Using force, dozens of police officers managed to stop them from doing so. Both groups vowed to keep protesting in Madrid and across the country until their demands were met. Back to you, Andradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Natasha Lowe in Verona, Italy. Here's an update for you on the 2024 Games. The Paris 2024 Olympics venue for badminton and rhythmic gymnastics was inaugurated by Mayor Anne Hidalgo. In a nod to sustainability, the arena uses photovoltaic panels for electricity, collects rainwater for toilet use and boasts 6,300 square meters of greenery on its rooftops. The seats were produced with recycled plastic bottle caps and soon there will be a heating facility that will capture cold and hot air and provide heat for the arena and neighboring residential buildings. Other there is Chetana Dharmaratna in Paris, France has the details. Chetana? Yes, Anuradi. The Adidas Arena with 8,000 seat capacity is the only new venue built within Paris walls for the Summer Games. It will also host para badminton and para weight lifting. Constructions began in 2021 and its opening was within the schedule. Hidalgo said the arena's key will be handed to the International Olympic Committee in May 2024. Medalists at the upcoming Paris Olympics will be rewarded with a piece of the Eiffel Tower unveiling the ribbons of the medals which are set with the hexagon-shaped tokens forged out of scrap metal from the monument. Paris 2024 President Tony Estanguet insisted he was beyond the reapproach admit an alleged legal probe into his remuneration as the president of the Paris 2024 Olympics organizing committee. Esangi, a three-time Conan Olympic champion, stated at the unveiling of the Paris 2024 medals that has not yet decided what his salary would be or how it would be determined. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Chetan Udharmaratna in Paris, France. Yemen's Iran-aligned Houthis said they had targeted a cargo ship in the Red Sea, the latest such strike since the start of the israel Hamas war in Gaza. The Houthis identified the vessel as the Star Iris. The group's military spokesperson Yahya Seresa said in a televised statement the ship was American, but maritime shipping trackers said the Marshall Islands flagship was Greek-owned. The British maritime security firm Ambry and the United Kingdom Maritime Trade Operations Agency said earlier that a Marshall Islands flagged Greece-owned bulk carrier had been targeted by missiles in two incidents while passing through the Bab al-Mandab Strait. The bulk was reported to hit and suffered damage to its starboard side. Ambry reported that the carrier had a sighted projectile near the vessel 23 nautical miles northeast of Djibouti's core Angar and 40 nautical miles southwest of Yemen's Red Sea port city of Mokha. Ambri said that the Balka was reportedly headed to Bandar Imam Khomeini, a city in Iran. The group owner of the Balka was listed on the US stock market index Nasdaq, which were identified as the likely reason for the attack. UKMTO said that it had received a report of an incident 40 nautical miles off Mokha, where the ship reported it had been attacked by two missiles. The crew were unharmed, UKMTO said, and the vessel is proceeding to its next port of call. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. What's the difference between organic matter and plain old dirt? Well, apparently there's more ways to distinguish the two than one. And one man is setting out to make that difference very clear. These may look like piles of dirt to you, because that's what they are. 
What they are not is piles of organic material wasting away in a landfill. That's because Neil Brooks has been collecting materials from local businesses around Phoenix that he can turn back into soil. Instead of taking it to a landfill and clogging up the landfill, we grind it up, we process it, and we create soil products. Everything from growing seeds to putting on the bottom of the bed to putting on, depending on what your needs are. So whether you're growing a field of crops or planting herbs on your windowsill, the soil being created from community scraps can go back to every member of the community who wants it. We will be diverting more than the city of Phoenix does with our composting project in the next six months. And Brooks has a whole team of workers turning the soil and watering it to preserve its nutrients. He says he's hoping people from all over the city will want to take part in this initiative for a cleaner, greener city. The cost of fuel, and the problems it takes now to, to build more and more dumps. We have, we have less and less land, we have less and less water. So we really want people to understand that it starts right in their backyard. It starts in your apartment in a container. A hopper is on the loose. Well, at least he was until authorities found the cheeky guy and wrangled him to safety. Here's the short but exciting adventure of one kangaroo in the thick of the night. There's a kangaroo in my uh, apartment complex. One may expect to see kangaroos in a zoo, and anyone heading to Australia probably wants to have a glimpse of the marsupials in the wild. But a kangaroo in a Florida apartment complex warrants a call to authorities. 911, do you need police, fire, or medical? I guess police. There's a kangaroo in my uh, apartment complex. A seven-year-old kangaroo, appropriately named Hopper, set off on an adventure. This was around 5 o'clock in the morning. Hopper sent Hillsborough County Sheriff's deputies on a call they'll likely never forget. Bravo 26, I actually see a kangaroo. It's kind of a large kangaroo. We got it close into the pool gated area. It took about 45 minutes to wrangle Hopper, thanks to the Sheriff's Department Agriculture Unit. Deputies fed the kangaroo while his owners were tracked down. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission requires residents to have a special permit to keep wildlife as a pet. Hopper's owner does have the correct paperwork to keep him, along with another kangaroo, in their home, according to the sheriff's office. And while it's definitely unusual, maybe next time authorities won't sound so skeptical when someone calls about a loose kangaroo. Complaints advising there's a loose kangaroo in the complex. First a squirrel and now a kangaroo. Animals are having way too many run-ins with the law these days. And that's all the stories we have for you tonight. Wrapping up, we'll see you tomorrow again for more updates on key global events. See you next time. Have a good night.